Hello, friends. Registration is now open for next year's Exiles in Babylon conference, and I cannot wait for this conference. Here's a few topics that we're going to wrestle with. The future of the church, disability in the church, multi-ethnic perspectives on American Christianity, and a conversational debate on the problem of evil and suffering. We have Eugene Cho, Elise Fitzpatrick, Matt Chandler, Michelle Sanchez, Justin Gibney, Devin Stahl, Lamar Hardwick, the list goes on and on. Joey Dodson's going to be there. Um, Greg Boyd and Clay Jones, are, they're going to be engaging in this conversational debate on the problem of evil and suffering. And of course, we have to have Ellie Bonilla and Street Hymns back by popular demand. And Tanika Wyatt and Evan Wickham will be leading our multi-ethnic worship again. We're also adding a pre-conference this year. So we're going to do a, um, an in-depth scholarly conversation on the question of women in ministry featuring two scholars on each side of the issue. So uh, Drs. Gary Bashirs and Sydney Park are on the complementarian side and Drs. Cynthia Long-Westfall and Philip Payne on the egalitarian side. So March 23rd to 25th, 2023, here in Boise, Idaho. We sold out last year and we'll probably sell out this year again. Uh, so if you want to come, if you want to come live, then I would register sooner than later. And you can always attend virtually if you can't make it out to Boise in person. So all the info is at theologyintherod.com. That's theologyintherod.com. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. Today is a Q&A podcast where I address several of the questions that my Patreon supporters sent in, and they sent in a ton of questions. I think right now I have at least 60 questions that have been submitted, and I um, that's just in the last like 24 hours or so. So I um, am going, I'm going to address several of their 60 questions here on this public podcast, and then the rest of them I will address on the Patreon only uh, podcast, which I'll release uh, probably next week. No, no, it's probably already been released by the time you listen to this podcast. Anyway, if you'd like to support the show and be part of the Patreon community, you can go to patreon.com forward slash theology in the raw. Support the show for as little as five bucks a month. Get access to several perks like you know, the ability to ask questions that I address on this show and on the Patreon only podcast. Okay, let's dive in. The first question is from Davis. And Davis asks, uh, when giving tithes, tithes and offerings, how much vetting is necessary on the organization I would be giving to? I definitely understand the desire to make sure your money is going to where it actually will help and make a difference. But I've also heard that tithing should be done out of faithfulness. I do lean toward, and this is going to be my response is going to be largely my opinion. Um, I, I do lean towards vetting as much as you can. I, I don't think that means, you know, flying out and touring the facility of, you know, the international justice mission or whatever organization you're thinking of um, meeting all the higher ups and having sit down meetings. I mean, there, you know, I, there's only, there's always more vetting you can do, but, but I, I do, I want to feel as confident as I can that my money um uh, is is going to good use is actually contributing to helping people because uh, as most of you probably know I mean you know you can actually try to help people you can actually give money to certain people in certain situations certain organizations and end up which end up actually might actually hurting people um, now that's not you know it's a it's a fuzzy line does that, does that mean you're responsible for hurting people because you gave to an organization that is not actually doing the good that they promised to do. I mean, I, you know, that's, that's, that's tough, but I, I, I do want to feel as confident as I can that my uh, contribution is actually meeting the needs of people. Um, so, and, and in this day and age, a lot of organizations that they're, they're pretty open with their finances. Um, and so I think you can do, I, I don't think it would take a ton of work to vet the organization um, as much as you can to where you do have confidence that your money is actually going towards good. Um, I will say that, you know, in terms of, you know, you, you use the term tithe and um, the concept of tithing, giving giving a tenth of your income to the church or whatever that's largely an old Testament concept. And even that, if you do the math on kind of a more holistic approach to giving in the old Testament, it's I've heard, I haven't done all the math or done all the research, but it, it's, it's a bit complicated in the old Testament because you're dealing with a, a nation state that is also the people of God. So it, it's, it's, it's a nation of Israel, but it's also the people of God who are Israel. And so there's a whole economic and political 
and religious network that's kind of all fused together. Um, so I, I don't think we can take the specifics of the Old Testament on tithing and apply it to the New Testament believer. I do think there's principles of being generous and caring for those in need in the Old Testament that do carry over into the New. And once you get into the New Testament, most of the giving passages, the passages, passages that encourage believers to give, to be generous, most of them, almost all of them are about wealthier Christians redistributing their wealth to help out poor, more poor, poorer believers in need. Um, one of the longest, actually the longest passages in the New Testament on giving is 2 Corinthians 8 to 9. And 2 Corinthians 8 to 9 is describing the so-called Jerusalem collection, where Paul traveled around the uh, Mediterranean world going to wealthier Gentile churches and was collecting money to give to the poorer, uh, largely Jewish church in Jerusalem because they had fallen upon hard financial times. This was a major aspect of Paul's second and third missionary journeys. It was a huge part of Paul's ministry as a whole. He talks about it in Romans 15, 1 Corinthians uh, 16, 2 Corinthians 8 to 9, uh, Galatians 2, um, the book of Acts, Acts 11 talks about it. I mean, th this is a pretty widespread theme in the New Testament, this, this kind of redistributing of wealth from wealthier churches to poorer churches. And there was also this kind of ethnic reconciliation component that was driving Paul as well. So, um, when I saw so that to say, if, if when I consider where, where am I going to give my money, I typically, uh, as much as I want to resonate with the main thread in the New Testament, I want to say, how can I help or give to an organization that's helping uh, poorer believers in, in need is, is not this, my sole focus, but is a primary focus. So let's uh, move on to the next question. We've got a lot of questions to work through here. Uh, Ryan says that he grew up dispensationalist uh, in a kind of left behind theology church. And you didn't know any better, but you say, you know, I was just waiting for the rapture to happen. Um, but also hoping that God would delay the rapture until I got married. So I wouldn't be a virgin when it happened. <laughs> oh my gosh. Said every single teenage boy growing up in a rapture theology church. Um <clears throat> Through a number of books and podcasts, uh, you come to realize that the eschatology I grew up with is not the most accurate reading of scripture. So I'm left wondering, what is a historic Christian view or theology of the end times? Okay. Um, I, you know, I, I, yeah, like you, I grew up in a um, dispensational environment. And I don't want to, I, 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 let me just say this. I think there are, in the church today, obviously, there are different eschatological views that are drawn from scripture. So, you know, various Christians who are all, you know, godly and smart are trying to work through scripture to figure out what does the Bible say about the end times. Um, I don't want to say, well, this one's terrible and this one's, you know, the best and this one's rubbish and whatever. Like, you know, um, I no longer um, find a dispensational interpretation of the end times to be the most exegetically compelling. Um, and, and there really is no singular historic Christian view of the end times. Here are some, I guess, I, so if I, if I wanted to say what are the main, in, main things that all Christians should b biblically believe about the, the future, I'm just going to say a few big picture things. Uh, the second coming of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, when Jesus returns, he's going to raise the dead. Um, according to John 5 and First Thessalonians 4 and Daniel 12, uh, he's going to raise the, the, the believers and unbelievers. They're going to face judgment. And on the other side of judgment, um, believers will go into what is called the new creation. Okay, so second coming of Christ, resurrection of the dead, judgment, renewal of creation. Th those are kind of the big picture ingredients that I think are are as clear as they can be in, in scripture. And, and I don't know, maybe some of you might even have quibbles about some, some of that, but I, I think those are, those are clearly revealed in scripture. Um, there's a lot of other, um, 
sub points that are less clear, you know, the thousand year reign, the millennial reign of Christ. Um, and this goes into more of a dispensational view of the end times where you have, you know, um, where you would have a, 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 a the rapture of the church and the seven year tribulation period. And then you have the second coming of Christ who establishes a thousand year millennial reign on earth. And then you have another, a, a uh, the great is it the great white throne judgment at the end of the thousand years, and then you have another kind of stage in the afterlife, which is the the eternal state. So a dispensational reading or even a premillennial reading will make a distinction between there's kind of two different end time states. There's a thousand year millennial reign, and then the eternal state after that. That paradigm rests largely on a quite literal reading of Revelation 20. Revelation 20 is the only place where we see a thousand year reign mentioned. Um, but here's the, here's my, here's my problem. And if you, if you, you, know, if you believe in a millennial reign, the literal thousand year reign, that's fine. Here's the reason why I don't is that the book of Revelation has loads of numbers in the book. I don't know of any single number. Well, do I, is there, let me just let me just be cautious. Almost all of the numbers in Revelation are clearly symbolic. Clearly symbolic. So, is it likely that when you get to Revelation twenty, and all of a sudden you see another number, one thousand, which is big round number, that that one isn't symbolic? So, at the very least, I, I think it's I think the the burden of proof would rest on somebody who interprets the thousand year reign literally in a book when almost all the numbers are not intended to be interpreted literally. Um, and some people say, well, no, okay, it's not literal. It's still a period of time. You still have a distinction between, you know, some kind of millennial reign and some kind of uh, eternal state. Again, e even that kind of two stage afterlife is, it still relies on the book of revelation. A lot, a lot of our differences in eschatology relies on different interpretation of different interpretations of a highly symbolic book, the book of Revelation. You take out the book of Revelation, all of a sudden you're kind of back to second coming of Christ, resurrection of the dead, renewal of creation. And I don't want to say that, that therefore we ditched the book of Revelation. I just think that we need to be very cautious in how much of our spe specific eschatology rests on a particular reading of Revelation. Um. The whole rapture thing, I mean, the, the pre-tribulational tri pre rapture largely rests, not exclusively, but largely on a particular reading of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to, 8, uh, 4, 13 to 17. Um, I moved away from this understanding of the end times when I wrote, it was actually back in seminary, I, at a dispensational seminary when we were one of our assignments um, in a class on the Thessalonian letters. So I think it was Greek exegesis too. Um, one of my favorite classes in seminary, actually. And and, and we work through the Thessalonian letters as, as part of our, you know, uh, honing our Greek. Um, and uh, one of the assignments was to write an eschatology of first and second Thessalonians. Meaning like if you were a Thessalonian believer and in walked the letter carrier who read out loud first Thessalonians and then also a year later or whatever, maybe a year before some people put the, some people reverse the chronology of first and second Thessalonians. Either way, if you read these two letters and that's kind of like, what would your eschatology be, be based on these two letters? I don't think you can really get a pre-tribulational rapture, seven year tribulation, and then second coming of Christ, meaning the second coming of Christ is different from what Paul is talking about in first Thessalonians four. I think that's really hard to get just from the letter itself. People get that by again, going to the book of revelation, maybe going to Matthew 24, um, and, and trying to piece together this kind of plan, uh, of the end times. One of the problems I have just with using first Thessalonians four, which is the main rapture passage as a rapture passage is that the language of being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The word for meeting there is, is a common Greco-Roman concept of, of emissaries from a city going out to meet the emperor and ushering him back to the city. So it's not that people go and meet the Lord in the air and then they go up to heaven. Rather, they go out to meet the Lord in the air to 
uh, accompany him as he returns to earth is is the image there and and the thessalonian letters are, are just saturated with a lot of kind of greco-roman empire imagery so um so even from that text alone i think it's it's tough to get a pre-tribulational rapture let, let alone the rest you wouldn't really get that from the rest of the new testament by itself so all that to say um yeah so to sum up my thought and and, and by the way I, I have not really studied these kind of questions in a long time so maybe there's been some definitive work in the last 10 years that shatters everything i'm talking about or whatever so i i'm i you know um definitely encourage you to do your own uh research on the end times it hasn't been really a major interest of mine for for quite some time so i'm, I'm reaching back decades of memory you know in my <laughs> the dark recesses of my theological memory here so all that to say second coming to christ resurrection of the dead renewal of creation those are the big ones got to embrace that a lot of the specifics within that you know i think we can have a um an internal Christian discussion about what's the best reading of scripture from there on. Next question from Becky, a newish, uh, you're a newish patron, patron supporter, and you have a, a huge heart for the LGBTQ community. And um, you spent the last several years learning as much as you can from, from me. Thank you. Um, and other voices on the topic currently attending the church you grew up in and sexuality in general has never been a topic that has been discussed. And you share a bit more thoughts here. I'm going to skip ahead. You really want the church to be a safe place for LGBTQ people. Um, you want to share. Oh, you you have a meeting with the elder board next month to share your heart about the need for grace and truth in addressing uh, sexuality and gender questions. And you're, so here's your question: Do you have any? Do I have any advice on where? you should start. Aside from one of our pastors and your dad, who's on the elder board, uh, I'll be walking into a room of men who have no idea the burden that has been placed in my heart. And like I said earlier, this topic is not is simply not discussed at our church. At the very least, I'd like to see this meeting open the door for a much needed conversation and you appreciate any advice I can give. Okay. Uh, oh, and your mom before little ones, um, you're feeling nervous. Man, so first of all, Becky, thank you for having the courage to do this. That, that's not, that's super intimidating to, to go in to a room full of elders who have never talked about this topic and try to help them to talk about this topic. That, that's, that shows a ton of courage. So thank you for modeling that. Um, I, would, I would have a, let me just give, um, I've got so many thoughts here I wrote out. I mean, this is a large part of what I do day in and day out is meeting with churches and helping them do this <laughs> to embody the holistic gospel toward um lgbtq people so i got a lot of thoughts and i tried to not take an hour here but um i guess my first question i, I think i know the answer to this but just to state it i, I would want to know is your church more progressive leaning or more conservative leaning so because churches might be silent on sexuality and gender questions for different reasons, uh, maybe more progressive leaning church might, I don't know. Um, they might think, well, if we start, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know why, why, I, mean, I guess a more progressive leaning church might, and I don't mean they're just simply affirming of same sex marriage, but maybe they're more that maybe they realize that the church is pretty split on this question. Maybe the leaders might be kind of split. And if they even begin to address questions related to sexual and gender, the church will split because they just like, oh man, people are all over the map on this. So I'm just going to, we're just going to be silent. Um, or if it's a more conservative leading church, maybe they just don't see the relevance of it. Or maybe they're maybe, um, yeah, they're like, well, no, I mean, just go read Romans one. Why do we need, need to have a, you know, a conversation about this? I, I don't know. There's different reasons why more conservative leading churches might not want to address the topic. But, you know, understanding where they're coming from would kind of maybe shape my approach to having this discussion. Because whether they're progressive leaning or conservative leaning, they probably have some fear-driven reasons why they haven't addressed the topic. Um, so I would want to kind of know a little bit going in, like, well, what are maybe some of the fears that they have that maybe you could help alleviate, you know? conservative leaning churches might be scared that if we talk about grace and love and kindness, then 
we're going to be um, drifting from the truth of God's word or whatever. Um, so I think there's ways to address that uh, concern. I would encourage you to exercise much, much grace and humility toward your leaders. I mean, th- think about this. I, and, and you probably know this. If you're a church leader, you definitely know this. Like, um, you got to think about this gathering from the perspective of the church leaders. I mean, walking in right behind you is another person wondering why the church doesn't address end times more. <laughs> And right behind them is another person saying, why don't we, you know, why aren't we more more vocal on six-day creationism or supporting Israel or promoting the latest political candidate? So church leaders, I, I I will tell you, for the most part, they are a bit, they have this kind of ongoing exhaustion of trying to entertain and meet the needs of everybody in the congregation that thinks they should be doing something more, doing something less, doing something different. Most church leaders I talk to, they just, they get exhausted with that. You know, you have even like announcements on Sundays, you know, you have, you know, 56 different people that week who said, Hey, can you announce this? Can you announce that? Can we promote this? Can we do that? Like leaders are bombarded with that kind of pressure from the congregations. And I'm not assuming that your church is, I'm just saying that is a very typical um, point of exhaustion from, from church leaders. So I think with that in mind, if you come in kind of guns a blazing, or this is the main issue, even, even if you're like, I think this is a huge issue we need to talk about. Um, I think you do want to come in with a lot of grace, humility towards your leaders, a lot of, you know, honoring them and the work that they're doing at at leading the church They, they don't want to be made to feel like they're not doing anything right because they're not, they haven't addressed the LGBTQ related, um, related questions. Okay. With all of that, I I think one place to begin might be alerting them to some of the, the urgency of these questions. I mean, you know, one phrase that I've often used is that, you know, questions related to sexuality and gender have become some of the most pressing ethical questions facing the church today. So, a good case can be made that it would be pastorally responsible to help Christians navigate what has become some of the most pressing questions facing uh, facing the church today. That that's, it seems like this is a a, a a a a not the only part of discipleship, not even not even to occupy the bulk of our discipleship, but is significant enough to justify. Hey, this is a a a, a an important area that a lot of Christians are really thinking through whether their LGBT themselves, or they're a parent with an LGBTQ kid or somebody who has a friends who are LGBTQ, or they're just trying to navigate our cultural moment where sexuality and gender questions are kind of all over the, all over the place, all over the place. Um, so I, I think there can be a pretty easy case to, and I don't know any leader who would really say, really, this doesn't seem that, I don't think a lot of people are really thinking about this. Really? I, I mean, I think it's a pretty easy case to be made that this is on a lot of people's minds for a wide range of reasons. Man, would we would I would really love for you leaders to help disciple me and the many others who need discipleship in this area. Again, giving honor to your leaders. Um, I, another angle too is you can point out that you know twenty just statistically at least twenty one percent of Gen Z people under twenty two identify as LGBTQ. And that percentage isn't too different inside or outside the church. Um, One fifth, one fifth of our next generation identifies as LGBTQ. And if they don't, almost all of them have friends that do. So if there's a bit of urgency, um, relevancy in the need to, for leaders to disciple their people in this conversation as a whole, all the more a need for our leaders to help raise up the next generation and disciple them well through a topic that is not some fringe thing any longer. Um, on top of, you know, a hyper, a decent percentage of Gen Z who identifies as LGBTQ, you have parents in your congregation um, who have kids who are, or kids or relatives who are, who identifies LGBTQ. And they're asking a lot of questions about how do I maintain biblical fidelity while also loving my son, my daughter, my son, who is my daughter, my um, cousin, my, my brother, my uncle, whatever. 
So there, there's there's enough people who this conversation is 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 personal, um, and they are they are really wanting to be discipled well in this in this topic. Um, oh, there's so much more I, I want to say. Um, having said all that, like I, I, <laughs> as much as I think leaders should be discipling their people in this topic. I would want the leaders to be make, make sure they're on they're going to do it well though too. Like if leaders do not embrace a really rich biblical view of marriage and sexuality and also understand that um the church has not gone about this conversation well, historically well at all and that um there's there's a lot of layers of just homophobia and bigotry toward gay people and LGBT people that still exist in the church. And if we're not willing to um, embody both grace and truth, um, then well, we, we shouldn't really address this conversation unless we're willing to um, to do that. And if you publicly disciple your people in a holistic gospel, Jesus-centered view of sexuality and gender questions, if you do that well, people will leave the church. Um, that's just a fact. So, and also people will probably gain, go to your church because there are a lot of people who are longing to go to a church that is willing to address um, these questions with grace and truth. So, uh, yeah. So all, all that to say, I, I almost, I almost wouldn't want your meeting to be too successful. Like all of a sudden, like next week they're preaching on, homosexuality or whatever like that. I'm like, well, 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 like I would want the leaders to recognize that this is complex and the leader should have loads of ongoing internal discussions and internal training, um, before they just start reaching out and, and addressing, um, this important conversation publicly. So much more to say baby steps, um, baby steps. I mean, sometimes they might, leaders might move slowly in this conversation. And I don't always think that that's, necessarily a, a bad thing. All right. Next question, Anna, uh, you haven't looked into this much, but some people say that Priscilla wrote the book of Hebrews. Do I have any thoughts on this and how would this impact the conversation on women in church leadership? Well, certainly if, if Priscilla did write the book of Hebrews, uh, which is called the book of Hebrews is called a letter of exhortation. Um, yeah, I think that would be, um, a significant, um, contribution to the conversation about women in church leadership. I did look into this a little bit. The evidence for, well, let me say, I was not impressed at all <laughs> with the evidence for Priscilla writing the book of Hebrews. And I'm not, please hear me. I'm not saying, well, <laughs> she's a woman. She couldn't have written the book of Hebrews. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, yeah, maybe, um, Maybe, maybe not. Like we just we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. I still think Apollos is probably the strongest candidate, but even that, it's like, but we we just don't know. Like, and the, so I did look at an article on the cbinternational.org website. Um, if you just Google CBE International and then Priscilla, author of Hebrews, I think that's the first thing that will pop up. The title of the, this article is Priscilla, author of the Epistle of the Hebrews with a question mark. And then this article kind of surveys all the arguments given for Priscilla. I wasn't impressed with it. I just wasn't impressed with the arguments. So maybe if you read the article, you'll be super impressed. I don't know. I just, um, they just, it just, they just all seems extremely, extremely speculative. Um, there is a book written by Ruth Hoppins called uh, Priscilla's Letter, which I believe there's a whole book arguing for Priscilla author in the book of Hebrews. Um, you can check that out on Amazon Priscilla Priscilla's letter. So I haven't read the book, so I can't comment on that. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, I just don't, yeah. Wasn't convinced by the evidence. So there I am. Um, again, I'm not saying there's, there's uh, a bunch of evidence that shows that Priscilla didn't write the letter. I'm just saying that, evidence for Priscilla writing a letter it doesn't seem very convincing to me. Next question, Brandon. Um, what is your opinion on heavy metal music? <laughs> I love these kind of questions. Uh, while I'd be interested in your taste in it, if you do uh, like it or hate it, what I'm really looking for, I guess, is a broader take on what some might call dark or angry art forms. I find them 
uh, cathartic and a welcome change of pace from what can often be inauthentic, syrupy, sweet Christian art. I love that phrase, Brandon. Syrupy, sweet Christian art. I love it. Uh, but have recently gotten pushed back from some of my uh, – love of such things uh even when said art is christian so even like christian heavy metal uh music life isn't always but roses you say uh, some things are worth getting angry about and i would argue there is biblical precedent for these type of artistic expressions um okay so um you first of all want to know my taste in heavy metal hardcore music I, it's it's not my favorite genre um there i grew up I think when I was younger, I liked it a bit more. So like Iron Maiden was one of my favorite bands growing up. Um, uh, of course, I mean, maybe it's not a course, but Metallica. Um, I still listen to Metallica when I'm working out at the gym. Um, not always, but sometimes. Um, I probably like some more punk. Is it punk metal? Like what would Rage Against the Machine be? Like I, I like Rage. Um, there's some other I can't I'm blanking on some bands right now. So so anyway, it's not my favorite genre, but yeah, when I'm especially when I'm working out for obvious reasons, um, I I typically listen to heavier, well not always, but so, typically heavier music. Um, so yeah, that's just my personal taste in it. In terms of a more the, theological response, I, I I think it's actually a weak argument to say that a certain genre of music is worse than other genres of music. And I, I mean, I think Brandon, we're going to be on very similar pages here. Like I, I think that, I mean, just take the Bible. The Bible is written in various genres, poetry, lament, um, a lot, some symbolic, uh, a lot of, a lot of symbolic apocalyptic literature and revelation and parts of Daniel and, and history and prose and, and, biography and the gospels and historiography and the book of acts and um love poetry and the song of songs and lament and lamentations you have darker forms of literature in the psalms even that's some I mean, the psalms span the whole gamut of human emotion so I, I don't um and you have different musical genres throughout the psalms um so I, I think the diversity of literary art forms in scripture does give some precedent for um, the diversity of all kinds of different art forms. And I 100% agree that um, art forms that only address the kind of rosy, syrupy, sweet Christian themes are dishonest. I'll, I'll, I'll be as strong as that. Like, um, life is complex, is beautifully complex, and any kind of art form that is honest will reflect that complexity or contribute to that complexity. Um, I think it was N.D. Wilson, uh, Nate Wilson. Is it Nate Wilson? N.D. Wilson, who's a brilliant Christian writer, son of Doug Wilson, by the way. Um, I find them to be very different for, if, in case you're wondering. Um, uh, but N.D. Wilson's uh, book, uh, Notes from a tilt -a whirl is a strange kind of book. But he, So he's primarily like a fiction writer for, I think, teens and children. And I think fact check me on this i think he said somewhere that true true honest literature even written for children should contain evil because that's honest life has evil life has sin life has darkness and it's dishonest if m music doesn't convey that if literary forms don't convey that if art doesn't convey that so or include that at least so yeah i, th I think um i don't think music musical genres that are more dark I, I would i would I, I think it's not enough to say that's allowed i would say that that's a necessary contribution to our more holistic um view of the world um what where is the christian version of raging its machine do you guys know of one <laughs> we, we need some christian songs or songwriters that sing about the gospel as political protest. I mean, Josh Garrels does some of that, I guess. Um, or who's that guy from uh, Cademan's Call? Shoot, what's his name? Is that what I'm thinking of? I haven't listened to him in a while, but he, he had an, oh, I'm blanking on his name, but he, there was, there was former Christian singer frontman who went solo and, and, and um, 
had a whole album that was kind of a kind of a kind of a political protest kind of album um i didn't love the sound of it but the the, the lyrics were really powerful um but yeah i think if i started a christian band it would be in the genre of rage against the machine actually so there is a um uh, I don't know if you've heard of a audio the audio feed music festival, audio feed out in uh, Champaign, Illinois every year around the Fourth of July. I used to speak at the audio feed um, uh, music festival every year. I did it for several years in a row, and, and it's they were all um, kind of these non mainstream, mostly non mainstream Christian artists like musical artists that were just different. You had christian metal bands you had um christian country kind of dark country (laughs) a buddy of mine brilliant um artist um would say it was in the genre of country but if you listen to his themes it's almost like um that's kind of i guess more of the uh, johnny cash um genre just a little more dark a little more thoughtful a little more artistic um, and, and everybody in between. I mean, it was it was really cool to see just so many Christians with s- such a diverse array of genres. So yeah, it, it is out there. But um, yeah, I just I just I'm not I don't find it compelling when people find certain genres more holy than others. You know, I mean some some Christian hymns can be like super Gnostic in their theology. Gnosticism was like the first heresy condemned by the church. Like that, this should be atrocious. You know, singing some of these hymns and yet we sing them in church. Um, or some contemporary worship music has kind of like Jesus is my boyfriend flavor to it, which I find to be incredibly offensive country music, you know, safe, right? Safe for the whole family, except that it can be profoundly syncretistic and it's God and country kind of theme. So yeah, I, 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 I just, I'm always nervous about Christians thinking that some genres of music are like safer or closer to the gospel than others. Um, I, I don't think, I think the gospel transcends and includes all kinds of genres. Okay. That's my response. Uh, Fred, uh, what are some good commentaries on the pastoral epistles? You say you're not looking for a 900 page tome that spends 50 pages exegeting one word, (laughs) but something like a two to 300 page commentary that is in tune with scholarly discussions, yet also practical for a peasant like you. For example, you recently read Michael Gorman's commentary on Romans. Michael Gorman's amazing. I'm going to get him on the podcast here soon. Um, so, uh, uh, and then Lucas chimes in with a similar question here. So my quick and easy answer is Ozzy Padilla, Osvaldo Padilla's very recent commentary on the pastorals in the Tyndale New Testament commentary series. I believe it's an update, uh, of the older Tyndale commentary on the pastorals by Guthrie, I believe, if I, if I remember correctly, but Ozzy's a, a friend of mine. We studied together at Aberdeen. He's a rock solid scholar and uh, his commentary, I think just came out or it's about to come out. So again, Osvaldo Padilla in, uh, on the pastorals, new Testament commentary series. It's going to, I think it's going to be right around your range, two to 300 pages. And, and he's just a top notch scholar. So he's going to be very aware of the scholarly discussion, even if he doesn't spend, you know, 200 pages on, summing up the scholarly discussion next question jeremy um you get so many you you say that i must get so many serious questions from patreon supporters so i figured uh, i would ask you something different for my first question it's more of a logistical question about the podcast i've enjoyed listening to the show these past two years and i'm always impressed with your range of guests what process do you go through to identify schedule and request guests for the show i'd love to hear more about the process especially since i'm a behind the scenes kind of guy okay good question um, yeah, how much I, I, I'm happy to share everything about my behind the scenes, um, my behind the scenes, uh, podcasting. So, uh, I'll start just with my schedule. So Tuesday I devote mostly to podcasting. I typically uh, schedule a nine o'clock, a 10 30 and a 12 o'clock, uh, podcast interview. Um, if I don't, if I can't fit all of those windows, like, like today I had one scheduled for nine o'clock and then now I'm recording, um, after that nine o'clock podcast, I'm recording this Q and a podcast. So, so, so sometimes I have other kinds of podcasts like Q and a podcast, or if I just want to spend a podcast, just talking about something like women in leadership or whatever. Um, I'll typically do that within that time frame, And then I usually, um, go to a coffee shop to, um, upload all the, uh, oh, then I also have to record an intro 
And then I go to a coffee shop, upload um, all, all the material to, to my Google Drive. And uh, while I'm doing that, I, I have a little Word doc where I have all the information, where I write everything out, uh, the, the, the person, any kind of editorial notes from my audio engineer, um, the summary, links, and all that stuff. And then and then, then I'm done. Oh, and I also have a running schedule where I am I'm have all the guests scheduled out. Um, when the podcast is going to be released. Sometimes it might be like two weeks later. Sometimes it might be a month later. Um, sometimes even longer than that. So I, I, I'm, t- I'm typically recording at least two, at the very minimum, two weeks ahead of time. Usually I'm like a month out. In terms of, oh, and, and then after that, I'm done. I I, I have a whole like kind of uh, company really that that takes it from there, that, that um Turns it into a podcast. I don't even know how to do. I wouldn't even know how to do it on the back end. I don't know that whole side of things. So, um, who do I schedule? I mean, I. It can be anything from like books I'm reading. So, like this morning, I just um, recorded a podcast episode with Patrick Schreiner. Um, really appreciate Pat- Patrick Schreiner's work, but I just read his or am reading his book, Political Gospel, and I was like, man, this is really interesting. I have some thoughts I'd like to bounce off of them. So I schedule the podcast there. Sometimes people reach out to me. I, I do get a lot of um, suggestions typically from like publishers who want me to promote their one of their authors, which I never do unless I want to. <laughs> yeah, just so you guys know, I know, I know I, I sound, it may seem like a lot of my podcasts are me promoting a book. Um, I only do that if I have found either the book or the author interesting, or if, if they're just writing on something, whether I read it or not, just kind of piques my interest. So, um, yeah, I'll never have somebody just because some publisher wants me to have them on the show. I, I have to want to have the conversation. So yeah, books I'm reading, um, some suggestions are, are thrown at me. There's, there's other just, I mean, over the years, there's hundreds of names of scholars, thinkers, leaders that I'm, I'm aware of that I would like to have a discussion with. Um, so for example, I'm, I'm doing a lot of reading right now on what's called um, anti-imperial readings of the New Testament. And Patrick and I got into this a little bit, uh, but there's a lot of scholars like uh, Warren Carter, Richard Horsley, and many others who, um, and, and T. Wright to some extent, um, who are who are writing on anti-imperial readings in the New Testament. That is, you know, parts of the New Testament that are critiquing the empire or the emperor in ways that are kind of subtle. And they draw out some of these subtleties. So for instance, right now, I'm, I'm trying to schedule Warren Carter, who's done a lot of work on this topic. And I'm like, man, that's a topic that I'm really interested in. He's done some great work on it. Let's have him on the show. Um, um, I typically... Like, how do I say it? Um, heterodox, n- not in a theological sense, heterodox, but in in more the cultural sense. Like people who question their own tribe, question their own denomination, question their own echo chamber if they're in an echo chamber. I typically like people who aren't don't live in an echo chamber. Um, I think it was. Um, there's an article written a while back from David, some political guy called from the edge of the inside, meaning like they're in this kind of big tribe, but they're kind of on the edge of it. <laughs> they're not just a blind sheep following their tribal allegiances, you know, wh- whether that's a denomination, a religious Christian social environment or a political tribe or whatever. I like contrary thinkers who are contrarian who are willing to say something because it's true, not because it will get a lot of likes from people that follow them. Um, so I don't like, I, um, you know, there's a lot of po- people out there and I, I get some, some you know, people throw me suggestions and I'll go and I'll scroll their social media or look at kind of their stuff. And I just, if they're just kind of parroting slogans that agree with their tribe or just, I don't know, there's just a, a lot of public thinkers out there that are just not interesting to me because they're just, if I can, if I can guess who you voted for within five seconds on your social media feed, I just, I don't find that kind of posture interesting to me. Um, I also, you know, if I, 
there's certain types of voices that reflect so much of my Christian upbringing that again, no, no, no offense at all to them, but it's like, I just, I swam in the, I swam in that body of water for such a long time that, you know, I already kind of know what they're going to say, know how they're going to say it and everything. And I'm just like, that doesn't feel very interesting interesting to me. I feel like I'm having a conversation with myself from 15 years ago and I don't, I'm not as interested in having a conversation with myself. Cause that would be a weird and B, um, I want to have a conversation with people who are, you know, ha- have a different upbringing, um, have a different way of thinking. Even if, uh, you know, a lot of my guests, I, I think we resonate with how we're thinking, but I also like guests that are bringing a different slant on certain things that I can learn from. I like to get people that are experts in areas of thought that I know nothing about. I mean, like recently I had on Alex Awad, who's a Palestinian uh, Christian. I'm like, I know hardly anything about Palestinian Christianity. Would love to learn from him. Um, other areas. Um, I mean, gosh, I, uh, let me look at my, Oh, I recently had Doug Smith on um, software engineer who wrote a, a, a book on, how social media and screens have hijacked our hearts and minds. That was super interesting to me. Um, he's done a lot of work in that area. Um, let's see. Lucas Pulley from, from the, uh, um, the Tampa underground doing a lot of really interesting, different things on, on how, how to do church. So th- those kind of guests, the people that are just doing something maybe different, not, not just to be edgy or different, but because they, typically have some kind of contrarian kind of spirit to them that I'm, that I'm interested in. Um, I, so uh, do I even really want to talk about this? Mm, sure. Here it goes. I, I, I really don't have, I, I don't believe in the kind of fear of platforming that, that some people have. Um, and, and I get, I mean, I, just so you know, cause I, I know some of you, reach out to me on, on this. Um, almost everybody I have on the show, there's somebody somewhere that doesn't like it. And it's always the same kind of tired slogan, you know, why are you platforming that person? I just, that the whole mindset behind that critique, I just don't even believe, I don't have that mindset. So that doesn't, it just doesn't, that critique just doesn't even resonate with me. Um, just the whole idea of you're platforming this voice that I disagree with or, or, or even like, you know, well, their ideas are harmful. Even that mindset, I just don't agree with. Like, I think, well, let, let me say, can I, certain ideas like, you know, Nazism, <laughs> whatever, lead to harm? Sure. Yeah. Behind every harmful act is a really grotesque idea that formed that way of thinking. Um, I just think the whole, you know, that idea is harmful is a, it's, it's just applied way, 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 way too broadly. And it's, it comes from a very slanted, biased, I would say naive perspective in most cases that I see it applied. Um, it, honestly, and usually it's kind of a cop out. It's when, and this is my, I guess my, maybe my perception when people don't really have a good counter argument or they don't want to do the hard work of, of, of understanding, trying to understand this other idea, living in that idea, then coming up with evidence that refutes that idea. When people aren't willing to do that hard work, they just kind of say, ah, that's harmful. It is my perception at least. Like it's just, I, I, I rarely see people that do the hard work of engaging in a book. They thoroughly read it. They digest it. They um, highlight some of the good things and they point out areas where, I, you know, they think it's wrong. Usually people that do all that don't say, and it's harmful. Usually it's just kind of somebody who says, well, I'm not going to read this book because it's harmful. I get that a lot. Um, I've had people that are about my books. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read your book because it's harmful. Like, how do you know it's harmful? What do you mean by that? So, um, uh, let's see. Yeah. So I, I, um, I, I don't, so, so, so some of you that might not like that I quote unquote platform this person or platform that person because their ideas are harmful or whatever. I, I just, that, that, that reflects a certain mindset that I just, I don't even agree with. I don't, I don't, I have a very different kind of mindset. Um, if someone's ideas are so bad that you shouldn't platform them, 
isn't that a good argument that you should platform them? Like if they're so obviously bad, then expose them. <laughs> it would be one approach, right? And I, I, I'm not saying I do that. That's not the purpose of this podcast is to take the worst thinker, put them on the platform so everybody can see how stupid they are. Like that's not, um, but if an idea is so bad that it doesn't even deserve interaction, then give it airtime, shine the light on it, expose how stupid it is. Um, but if it's not so obviously wrong, then maybe we should at least consider it so that we can think through it and then refute it if there's better evidence to the contrary. So as I've often, often, often said, um, this podcast is more like a conversation with a neighbor with the, with the record button on rather than a message from a church stage or whatever. Okay. So, um, I don't, if I was talking to my neighbor and somebody came along and says, Hey, why are you platforming your neighbor? Why are you giving them honor by talking to them? It's like, well, I just, I think you misunderstand what we're doing here. This episode is sponsored by Biola University's Talbot School of Theology. Okay, so I get asked a lot about which seminaries do I recommend, and my response is always the same. It's, well, it kind of depends on what you're looking for. But no matter what, Talbot is always one of my top recommended schools, partly because I feel like I know like half the professors there, so I can vouch for you know who they are and 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 I know their character. I know what you're going to get into. But I've also spoken on campus, which had amazing time on the campus there. I've had several of their profs on the podcast. Here's what I love most about Talbot. They do a fantastic job combining rigorous scholarship that's saturated with a deep love for the church. And it's all integrated with a pervasive emphasis on spiritual formation in the lives and hearts of the students. The professors are super down to earth. They're involved in their churches. Many of them are pastors at their church. And they also write high powered academic books. So if you're looking to deepen your understanding of scripture um, or just be more equipped to serve your family, your church, the world around you, Talbot offers many different courses and degree programs. And they also have done a really fantastic job with their online program where you can attend live online or watch pre recorded courses courses by some amazing professors. So if you've been thinking about going to seminary, check out biola.edu forward slash Talbot. That's T-A-L-B-O-T. Biola.edu forward slash Talbot uh, to get more information. Patrice, maybe just answer the question I sent you recently regarding Revoice and World Magazine. Um, And then uh, Brandon says, we'll post it here. Maybe he will. Yeah. So, um, I, I've gotten several questions about this. If you're not familiar with it, just Google, let's see if I can pull up the, I I did, um, pull it up here. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, did I lose it? Um, oh no, here it is. The article is called identity crisis, ascent, ascendant, gender, gender, idolatry, gender, ideology undermines group trying to balance homosexuality and biblical orthodoxy, uh, from world magazine. Um, I'm not familiar with world magazine. Somebody sent me this. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's kind of popular because I had several people kind of ask me about this because basically this article, um, is critical of the revoice conference that I, um, have and will continue to promote. And people say, are, are you're on the leadership of revoice, right? Well, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure what I do. I'm, I'm like part of a, um, I'm not, a, I'm not on formal leadership with revoice. I'm part of a, I forget the name of it. Like, like it's like a sounding board for um, when Revoice has certain ideas or maybe a statement they're releasing that that we can give feedback on, um, which I don't think we've had even like a meeting in like two years, I don't think. Um, so minimal, minimal. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't even say I'm not on leadership at Revoice at all. Um, there's there's other leaders leading Revoice. I'm friends with and have deep respect for the leaders at Revoice. Uh, leaders at Revoice. Uh, Nate Collins is a good friend of mine. Uh, Becca Mason and others there that I I have deep deep respect for. Um, so I am a huge fan of Revoice and would encourage people to go to Revoice. Um, I think they're doing great great work. Now, there's some thing. So the article. What do I want to say about this article? First of all, and I don't know the author. I'm not gonna name. I don't even know who it is. 
I'm not going to name the author because I could, well, here, oh, here's the author. I'm not going to name the author because I, I really don't know this person at all. Um, but they just, the article itself, it kind of showed that they're not, they don't seem to be very up to speed on the LGBTQ conversation, just in the language they're using and how they frame things. And like, you can tell when you're in this conversation, like I've been for many years, you just kind of can tell really quickly um, where people are coming from, kind of maybe what people they're, who they're listening to, who they trust in this conversation. So I can tell when I started reading this really quickly that, oh yeah, okay, this person's coming from probably this way of thinking and um i'm just i'm probably going to not resonate with where they're coming from in this conversation so already i can tell we're kind of coming at this from different angles um one, one thing that i i mean just from a journalistic perspective this the author cites more authoritatively some christian leaders who to the best of my knowledge have not been to revoice to get their thoughts on revoice. Now that just doesn't just journalistically like if I was going to you know be critical of the Southern Baptist Convention's annual meeting and I cited people maybe from non-Southern Baptist churches who didn't go to the meeting, who was critical of the meeting, I'm like wait a minute, but I'm drawing on a source that wasn't even there. Um I, I think this leader, let's see, the, I think the author was there because the author is quoting from several things that were set, was said at Revoice. I, it, from my vantage point, it does seem like the, the writer went in already jaded with how they thought about Revoice and then highlighted further things that they disagreed with that, were, that was said from the stage. Like it seems to be spun in a certain direction that rather than actually representing holistically the, the conference as a whole now okay so let me say this i was not at the most recent conference okay I've, I've been to most revoice gatherings i wasn't at the last one so yeah i should i should say that that um so i so uh, here's the deal uh, revoice um it is committed to a historic Christian view of marriage and sexual relationships. That's the view of the leadership. It's the view of Revoice as a whole. Um, <clears throat> and I believe all of the speakers have to abide by that general belief. But Revoice is going to allow a different range of kinds of speakers who might use language differently, who might use the term same-sex attracted, others who might use the term gay Christian, some who might use the phrase, I think they even say in the article, like sex assigned at birth, others who won't use that phrase, uh, different people who have different views on LGBTQ identities. So so they're, they're, they will have various speakers on stage that might disagree on some of the more secondary, what they would consider, what I would consider more secondary issues within the broader sexuality and gender conversation. Um, there's things, so just to be completely honest, I mean, I've spoken at Revoice at least twice, I think. Um, and, uh, and there's other speakers. Well, what am I, no, sorry. I'm brain fart, lost my train of thought. Um, yeah. So I've spoken to Revoice a few times and I'll, every, anytime I can go speak. And if I'm invited back, then I'll go speak. Um, I, some people in Revoice like it when I speak, other people don't like it when I speak. There's people in that community. I'm sure they're like, ah, what's this straight dude doing on stage? You know? Um, so I, yeah, there, there's diversity in the Revoice gatherings. Um, and there's stuff when I'm at Revoice and I hear certain speakers, sometimes I'm like, oh man, that I, I, I think that was spot on. I agree with most of what that person said. Other times I'm like, ah, yeah, I totally don't agree with how that was said or wouldn't say it like that. Um, the, the phrase like sex assigned at birth, I, I think that's a ridiculous statement. It's just scientifically bankrupt, really. I mean, so I, I don't use that. I don't use that phrase. And when people use it, I kind of like, it's kind of an eye roll. Like, ah, oh, come on. Like, what do you mean by that? Um, uh, there's other phrases here, even even some things that were stated in this article. I'm like, yeah, I, I don't I don't like that phrase, <laughs> but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that that this phrase or that phrase or this word or that identity marker or this or that 
um, means the whole gathering of revoice is even reflective of that or that the whole gathering is not doing a lot of good. Here's the deal, folks. Revoice exists because the church is not doing its job. There, there wouldn't be a need for same-sex attracted, gender dysphoric, whatever phrase you want to use, peep Christians who are adhering to a traditional sexual ethic in 2022. That's a radical thing to do. To say, because of my allegiance to Jesus, I'm going to commit my life to celibacy or I'm going to maintain this marriage. I'm not going to leave this marriage. I'm going to strive to glorify Jesus, even though I'm attracted to the same sex and married to someone of the opposite sex. That it, it is sad that somebody with that level of commitment to the Lordship of Christ comes to revoice and says, ah, finally, I can feel like I have community. They should feel like that in our churches. They wouldn't need to fly across the country to attend revoice if they had a flourishing environment in their churches. And the fact is, and it is a fact, it's what keeps me in business. It's why I'm hopping on a plane tomorrow yet again to talk to another organization and, and why I go to churches all the time to help them to, to create environments where um, gay and lesbian and same-sex attracted Christians who are following Jesus faithfully can can find community and, and love and purpose in, in their church communities. It, it's a huge need. So, and that's something like, I would love this article to spend half the time talking about that. Rather than critiquing Revoice, let's talk about why all these people are flooding to Revoice. Well, they're just people on a slippery slope to liberalism. Oh, come on, like that. I don't know. If, I'm not saying the article said those exact words, but that's kind of the fear. Um, that this is kind of just orthodoxy light. And again, I'm saying that there are certain things that said from stage to Revoice. I'm like, ah, yeah, that feels like orthodoxy light. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, but that's not, I, not, I'm not, so I want to make a distinction between all the various speakers on stage that, you know, um, are in different, um, different paths, different journeys who are all embracing a traditional sexual ethic, but some might be stronger on that than others. Some might use language differently than others. The leaders of Revoice to, to maybe some people's surprise from my vantage point are theologically really conservative or I hate the term conservative, um, are the theologically unambiguous in their commitment to the traditional sexual ethic. Um, I do think, so Revoice is, I think, still in a process of trying to figure it, figure out where they're at on some of the uh, complicated gender uh, questions re regarding transgender identities. Um, and so I think, um, and even this article has, you know, or even in the subtitle, ascendant gender ideology. That's there is no gen, there is no ascendant gender ideologies. There are uh, ideology. There are gender ideologies. So whenever even that, just in the subtitle, when I see whenever I see the singular gender ideology, I'm like, ah, eh. I probably can guess where this is going to go. There are gender ideologies. The phrase gender ideology is like talking, it's like saying the phrase like Baptist ideology. It's like, well, what do you, American or conservative or reformed or Southern? Or like, there's just a lot of diversity in ideologies about gender, a lot of diversity there. Um, and I think, yeah, Revoice, admittedly, very publicly, is, is really saying, hey, we're really clear on this uh, same sex marriage question. We're clear on same sex sexuality. We're committed to Christian orthodoxy when it comes to. Uh, marriage and same-sex sexual relationships. When it comes to some of the nitty-gritty gender questions, there's some complications there that that we're not you know, don't have completely ironed out. All the more reason to have a conversation, have a conversation, and that's what Revoice is. Um, it's kind of like this podcast. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll continue to support Revoice, not because. Everything said from the stage, I 100% agree with, but precisely because I don't. I think it's healthy for people to be in environments where there is a commitment to Christian orthodoxy, but diversity on some of the less, lesser significant questions about identity, terminology, and so on and so forth. Okay, next question. Wayne, uh, thanks for conducting these Q&A opportunities. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Recently, a Patreon supporter asked you about Alyssa Childers and some of her work. You said you were not too familiar with her, except that you knew she was not a PhD scholar. I deeply appreciate the caliber of people you bring on your podcast and the deep scholarly work they represent. Concerning Miss Childers, uh, my thoughts turned to Brian Zahn. He's not an academic scholar, but I deep, deeply appreciate his work, as do many others, including you. I listen to her podcast, uh, Alyssa's uh, podcast, almost as regularly as yours, and she seems solid, though with some different emphases from you to to my perception you seemed a bit dismissive of her work would you ever consider having her or someone like john stone street on your podcast wayne thank you thank you thank you thank you for bringing uh this up um i want to respond to this um with some clarifying thoughts um yeah and i and i if i first of all i did not mean to dismiss her work. Alyssa, Alyssa, if you're listening, I apologize to you. If, 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 if I, some of these like apologies, sometimes apologies aren't real apologies. So I want to be, I don't want to be fake here. I apologize if I dismiss your work. I did not mean to dismiss your work. I don't know your work, so I, I can't dismiss it. Um, and, and so, so I'm sorry if I, if I came off that way, L- let me, Here's where I did, if I remember correctly, somebody asked somebody the the question had to do with Alyssa saying that a departure from believing in eternal conscious torment, or I think, was it a young earth theology or something with creation? Oh no, maybe it's a literal Adam and Eve. Um, Is a departure from like the authority of scripture. And that's where I would disagree. I disagreed specifically with those two claims in as if Alyssa has made those two, if Alyssa made those two claims, then I'm an annihilationist. I don't, and accusing me of of departing from the authority of God's word because I believe in what I take to be the most biblical view of hell. I, I, yeah, I don't agree with that. So if she said that, I I disagree with that. Um, So I, I, but I should not have, I don't think I did, but if I did, then I should not have made broader uh, critiques of Alyssa's work again, when I admittedly don't know her work really. So I'm, I was just going on how the the questioner um, summarized some of her conclusions. I'm like, yeah, if, if that's true, then I don't agree with how that's being framed. In terms of um, Alyssa not being a PhD scholar, I'm pretty sure I didn't say people need to be a PhD scholar for me to view them as credible or to have them on the podcast. I mean, let me just look at, Several of my last guests, Doug Smith, no PhD, Alex Awad, no PhD, Josh Porter, no PhD, John Tyson, no PhD, Mike Erie, no PhD, Lucas Pulley, no PhD. I mean, so these are all, this is, I'm, I'm just going down the line here. Um, Josie Sprinkle, no PhD, <laughs> Lou Phillips, no PhD, my wife, no PhD. So the last time I had a PhD on was October 20th. It, it, sorry, I'm, the, the release of this podcast, I'm recording this on Monday, what is it, uh, November 28th or something. So as of November 28th, it's been over, over a month since I had a PhD. That was Dr. Lynn Kohick. Uh, Tony Scarcello, no PhD. Then I did have a couple of PhDs on October 13th. Patrick Miller, Keith Simon, no PhD. Dr. Dan Wallace, PhD. So so anyway, all that to say, yeah, I, I demonstrably, I, I do not require a PhD scholar to be a guest on the show at all um and and absolutely i don't think somebody needs to have like a phd to be a respectable thinker in my eyes if i um if i remember correctly what i think i said was i think i use a broader phrase like a in my quick googling it didn't seem like Alyssa had like theological credentials might be the phrase i use that should have been the phrase i use like at least maybe like a master's level in theology or at least something like that. Um, and even if I made that critique, I hope I would have said, or I'll say it now, even that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not a good theological thinker. So I'm going to, um, if I did assume or say that somebody needs even, even a master's in theology to be a good theological thinker, that, that, isn't necessarily true. Uh, again, several people that I listed on just who have been on my podcast, I think are great thinkers. And some of them don't, don't even have a master's degree in theology. Um, 
would I consider having her on? I would consider having her on. Like I would need to be more familiar with her work and be interested in having her on. Like I would need to find her thought interesting to, to, to have her on, but I have no theoretical reasons why I wouldn't have her on. Um, John Stone Street's a friend. I love John. He's a super brilliant thinker. Um, and he's got a good taste in cigars too, by the way. Uh, we went, we've been hunting and fishing together. Uh, so yeah, I would have John Stone Street on in a heartbeat. Um, uh, and I've had, I mean, I, I, it sounds like, so you're, if I'm reading between the lines here, it sounds like Alyssa and John maybe are more on the conservative side of things. Would I have more conservative side people? people on i i feel like i do i but i mean uh just kind of glancing at well i don't know i don't much time i want to take on this um uh yeah i don't want to take too much time here but yeah i try try to have people a, a, a range of theological perspectives on within historic orthodoxy i guess um so yeah, so let's see. Yeah, so again, sorry if I uh, um, said something that was maybe condescending or dismissive of, of, of somebody's work. Next question, Whitney Jean. Um, you say, we just decorated our church for Christmas, which is medium great. <laughs> I never know how I want to feel about it. Do you? What do you think about Christmas trees in, church, in the church sanctuary? It's nice and sparkly and festive, but the closeted hyper traditionalist in me gets bent when i see secular decorations in sacred space or are christmas trees sacred i have no idea seems like they are uh there are articles allying them with paganism and other articles praising their christian origins uh varying input is welcome from the patreon community um yeah i would love for my other patrons to chime in on this question i I, I don't know the origins of the Christmas tree. I'm almost positive it doesn't have Christian origins, but I um I remember Googling this a while back and I forgot what I found. But um I'm so I'm not an expert. I, I would say I'm not a huge fan nor a huge critic. In other words, like if a church had Christmas trees in the sanctuary, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna raise a big stink about it. Um if they had like American flag in the sanctuary, that's where I'd be maybe more critical. Maybe I should, maybe I should be more critical of the Christmas tree. Um, but I'm also, if they chose not to have a Christmas tree, I'm not going to say, where's the diagram Christmas tree? We, you know, we need to put these in the sanctuary. I wouldn't do that either. I don't, um, I, I guess maybe I'm just so used to, um, used to churches drinking too deeply from, secular culture when it comes to these holidays that I'm just kind of used to it, that I kind of doesn't really bother me anymore too much. Um, but yeah, I, w I wish there was more, I mean, sure. I would want more biblical memorabilia, maybe a dragon, maybe some, maybe some, give me, give me some, um, revelation 12 and 13 Christmas themes, dragons and serpents and, you know, um, women giving birth and escaping to the desert or what i mean <laughs> herod slaughtering the newborn kids in bethlehem or you know like i yeah i i personally i'm, I'm always a fan of let's 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 use symbols and art to wrench american christians from our complacency from our nice and easy christianity so yeah sure i would um be a huge fan of using christmas trees for firewood and getting a couple dragons up there and you know uh, Michael the Archangel, you know, wrestling the dragon behind the stage or something like that, you know. Um, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Next question, Luke. Um, 2 Timothy 2, 8, 8 to 15. Um, does the historical context of this, of this letter being written sp specifically to Timothy as opposed to an entire church change how we interpret Paul's message? Okay, so yeah, First Second Timothy written to a an individual Titus written to an individual Philemon written to an individual. Um, the fact that these aren't written to churches, well, specifically, I guess, um, first Timothy two, 18, eight to 15. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that would really, I don't think so. Um, it is written to Timothy, but it's how Timothy is to establish leaders and, and how those leaders should lead the church in Ephesus. So the fact that it's addressed to a leader of a church, not the church as a whole, I think at the end of the day, I don't think it's 
I don't think that means that because it's addressed to an individual, it's, it's less applicable to, uh, the whole church. Um, now you, you do kind of hint at, and I, uh, I think I'm going to address this. Maybe, I'm gonna, maybe I'll address it in the Q and uh, Patreon podcast, but, um, the, all letters, all New Testament letters do run the tension of being situational. Like there's a specific historical situational context that's being addressed. And yet that situational letter has been included in the canon of scripture because it is applicable to the church as a whole. And so all, all New Testament letters at least have this tension. The one that has the least amount of tension in this, in this area is the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesian church, because it is a circular letter. It, it's not, um, Ephesians doesn't seem to be focused on one kind of specific church situation. It is kind of the kind of universal vision for God's plan for the church as a whole. Um, sometimes Romans is viewed as a less situational letter, but Romans, once you get towards the end of the letter, Romans 9 to 11 or 14 to 15, you begin to see, oh, there's, there's definitely some stuff going on in Rome that Paul's uh, seeking to address. Um, so yeah, I mean, all letters are situational um, and yet they're also canonical. They're, they're in the canon of scripture. So when James 1 27 says, you know, true and undefiled religion is um caring for the orphans and widows in, in their distress and keeping oneself unstained by the world or however it goes. That's also in a situational letter. And yet we would all agree that that has universal kind of application. Now there are some things in these situational letters that might be limited to the specific situation that's being addressed. And and this is where, what I think what you're ultimately getting at is first Timothy two eighteen to two, eight, two, eight, two, eight until verse 15. Um, you know, this women shall not teach or exercise authority over man. Is that something that is Paul's saying only to the local Ephesian context in the first century? Or is that meant to be a sort of global statement for all churches of all time? That's a complex question that I'm not going to address here because I don't have it all worked out in my head, but, um, I don't think we can say since it's addressed to an individual, namely Timothy, therefore, uh, this passage itself is only for that individual in that individual situation. Maybe, but the fact that it's addressed to an individual, I don't think proves that necessarily. Next question, Amy. Um, uh, I was telling some friends about your view of hell and how deeply you researched it. And one said that view sounds dangerous. I think the fear of a lifetime of torment makes many people become believers in Jesus Christ. What would you say to that? I've got a lot of stuff to say. <laughs> um, first of all, I think all Christian doctrine is dangerous. If it's not dangerous. If it's safe, then it's probably not sound. Um, so I don't, that critique doesn't really uh, stick. I, I, you know, and I've heard this before, you know, well, you know, the eternal conscious torment is a, is a more compelling gospel you know, turn to Jesus. Otherwise he's going to um, torment you forever and ever. S sounds pretty severe uh, versus if you don't turn to Jesus, then he's just going to kill you. Sounds in some people's minds that that sounds less severe to me. That sounds pretty eerie as well. But um, for me, I, I don't even be, I don't even think I, I don't determine the veracity of a doctrinal claim based on whether I think it's dangerous or not dangerous or more compelling or less compelling. I base it on whether or not it has the more compelling biblical evidence in favor of it. Um, so that's what I'm always going to come back to. We should first ask, is it biblical? Um, does the text of scripture in all its diverse expressions and all the different places that it talks about, the afterlife for non-believers and all the place that talks about hell or some kind of punishment for unbelievers. Um, what is the best exegetical reading of those texts? That's the primary ultimate thing we need to ask. Not, well, this, if it's, if it's, if this doctrine is true, then, and, and then you start kind of speculating on the utility of that theological conclusion. Um, 
Yeah. So, so, so to me, the utility of the theological conclusion, whether ECT would be a more effective evangelistic tool is almost an irrelevant question to me. Um, I would also, but <laughs> since we're on it, I, I would wonder whether that, um, just even the way you, it's worded here, you're, you know, if you're summarizing your friend accurately, the, the fear of a lifetime of torment makes many people believers in Jesus. What kind of belief is that going to cultivate? First of all, and second of all, w- w- in the Bible, the th- the th- the threat of hell is almost always spoken to religious people who thought they were in. I think in every case, let let me just be safe. In almost every case, let's, at the very least, when Jesus talked about hell, it was to Jewish people who thought they were in. Um, in the Book of Acts. You don't see a lot of apostles running around the Greco-Roman world threatening eternal conscious torment or just hell to pagans to get them to believe in Jesus. That that's not that doesn't seem to be the the, the New Testament itself doesn't use um, the doctrine of hell in that manner as, as some sort of like evangelistic tool. It's more of a warning to those who think that they're in at least in, in how how the doctrine is is used. So yeah, just the idea of, you know, um, threatening people with lifetime of torment, making people believe in Jesus. I, I just, even that whole idea, I've, I've got biblical problems with. Next question, Charlene, um, pushing back on my answer to the question about an, okay, this has to do with the elderly couple um, that, uh <clears throat> Okay, so the question that came up last month is, uh, you know, from, I forgot, was it from you, Charlene, or, or somebody else? Anyway, the question was, you know, I learned about an elderly couple that I thought was married, but in fact was not married, and they're both living together. Um, is this okay? And I answered pretty strongly that no, I don't think this is okay. Um So you say, Charlene, uh, yes, you do think that, they need to be married in order to have a sexual relationship together. So you're agreeing with what I said. Um, however, do you think it's ethical to get, quote, Christian married without being, quote, married in Babylon? For example, what if this couple wanted to devote their lives to each other, each other in a covenantal Christian marriage, but still needed the pension payments and other benefits in order to survive since, let's assume, neither one can physically work. work. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I'm, I think I'm all for that. I say, I think I, I, you know, I would love to hear the counter argument, but I, if somebody is quote, getting Christian married, like they are publicly committing to each other in a way that the church is going to hold them accountable. I don't, I, then, yeah, I think that that's fine. I don't think they need the state. I don't think they need Babylon to recognize that necessarily. Um, marriage is a Christian institution. It's a, it's a, it's a, theological thing that's happening that the state happens to recognize, but the main thing is the Christian thing going on. So, um, yeah. And, and I'm, I'm all for, I almost said sticking it to Babylon, but I, I, I that's not a good phrase. Um, yeah, I, I, I would, I would think that's fine personally. But they have to, but again, they have to be married in, in, the, in the Christian sense. And, and I don't even like that. The idea of like, I do think there is a public communal aspect of marriage. So it, I, I don't think just a private commitment, like late at night, one night, they're like, hey, I'm going to be committed to you. Okay, I'm going to be committed to you. I do think that there needs to be some kind of public communal act um, demonstrating this commitment to each other in, in, in the community. Um, there's a couple other... Yeah, so I'm going to, and then you have, there's some other patrons here who commented on this question. A lot, a lot of people want to kind of were agreeing with the pushback here. But again, I don't hear a lot of pushback, Charlene, because you said you agree with how I responded to the actual question before, which was about an old couple that weren't, they weren't married, is how the question was framed. That's what I was responding to. Um, but could they just engage? Uh, oh, Ryan also chimes in here. Um, yeah, with kind of the same thought that, you know, could they not engage in a Christian marriage without being recognized by the state? Yeah. 
uh, barring some unforeseen evidence to the contrary, I think that would be perfectly fine. Next question, Kanan. Uh, the common belief that most Acts 29 churches hold is that elder and pastor are the same office position. Is that elder and pastor are the same office or position? And therefore, the title pastor is reserved for qualified men. Other churches, some Acts 29, others not, hold to a more nuanced view. For example, Bridgetown in Oklahoma City, with uh, which is Acts 29, and Bridgetown, or sorry, no, Bridgeway in Oklahoma City with Sam Storms, which is Acts 29, and Bridgetown in Portland, uh, not Acts 29, uh, that's the one John Mark Comer founded, have 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, qual qual qualified men as elders, but believe that qualified men or women can hold the title of pastor, and they are not elders, overseers, but more like leading deacons. Um, what are my thoughts on this? <clears throat> let, let me, so um, I do think there is good evidence that the biblical term pastor is synonymous with elder. And let me, let me, let me footnote this for a second. Um, there's only one passage that I'm aware of where the noun pastor is applied to a Christian leader. Ephesians 4.11, um, when Paul says, uh, Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and the pastors and teachers to do the work of the ministry, to equip the body for ministry and so on and so forth. This is the only place the noun pastor, poema, I think it is, um, that's applied as a title or title slash office to a leader in the Christian church. Um, so we don't have a lot to go on. And this verse, Ephesians 4.11, doesn't say these pastors, teachers, and, and there's something with the grammar here where pastor, teacher could be correlated. So it's kind of one office, not two different ones, pastors and also teachers, but pastor, teachers. I think the, the grammar is a little complicated, but um, could be referring to pastor slash teachers here. They're not explicit. So the only passage where we have the noun pastor used to apply to a Christian leader doesn't explicitly say they, these are also the same thing as elders or overseers. However, uh, two other passages are relevant. Acts 20, verse 17 it says that Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. And then a few verses later in verse 28, he tells the elders that he's talking to, to keep watch over yourselves and all the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And then he commands them to shepherd the church of God. That's a verb. Okay. I think it is. The NIV has, makes it sound like a noun, like be shepherds of the church of God. Pretty sure that's not, um, let me see. There's a footnote here. Let me see if there's, uh, give me one second. Wait for it. Wait for it. Um, oh no, the footnote is talking about something else. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So here the, uh, the elders are also called overseers and they're described as shepherding, pastoring, the same word, uh, the flock of God. So here pastor is not a title or an office or a noun. It's an activity, a description of the activity of the elders. The same thing in first Peter five, where the Peter says, you know, to the elders among you shepherd again, verb God's flock that is under your care. So again, and, and again, so shepherd is the word pastor here. So the, the verbal verbal form of pastoring is applied to elders. So th that's, that that's kind of, Kind of all, oh, in, in First Peter five does also use the term pastor in a noun, but it's applying to Jesus. Uh, verse four: When the chief shepherd or chief pastor appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So, um, it's so so. These are really the three main most relevant passages to your question about whether an elder is also a pastor. Um. In as much as the verb pastoring is applied to elders, seems to be a correlation there. But honestly, I mean, a lot of modern day churches use titles like director or youth leader or whatever. Like we, we kind of use our own titles today that aren't necessarily drawn straight from the New Testament. And so I don't know if a church... 
I, I'm a fan of staying as close to the biblical text as possible. So I would probably um, lean more, let's see, toward m most Acts 29 churches saying that elders and pastors are one and the same. Um, if you have a church like uh, both of these Bridgeway and Bridgetown, where you have male only elders, but women pastors to me that it's kind of just a terminological thing. Like, like I think I, I would, pr I would probably prefer calling if they believe that only men can be elders, but women can be preachers and teachers. Then I would probably use the language of maybe preacher and teacher, um, or use the language of prophet if you want to do that. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I lean towards uh, elders and pastors being more or less synonymous in, in the New Testament so that pastors are elders, elders are pastors, elders are clearly in the New Testament, the ones pastoring uh, the church. Next question. How many more do we got here? Oh, last one. Okay, last question. Jonathan uh, wanted to get my take on some Anabaptist and Mennonite groups that literally believe women need to cover their head, their hair with a piece of cloth or lace per first Corinthians 11, uh, was that Paul's intent that women cover their hair or was that just directed to the Corinthian church? Great question. One of the toughest passages in the new Testament, first Corinthians 11 is riddled with exegetical hurdles. It's not, that's not actually the best metaphor. Like we're supposed to leap over these hurdles. Um, exegetical difficulties, problems, questions, tensions throughout first Corinthians 11, and I have just so you know, I have not studied thoroughly First Corinthians 11 yet. So I, I my answer here is going to be um, hold it with a grain of salt. I will say, actually, I need to bring this up. I need to bring this up. Um, Mike Winger, who is a popular YouTuber, podcaster. I mentioned Mike and his work on the women in leadership question. And he, he's been doing a lot of work on this in his podcast slash YouTube channel. And I was um, somewhat critical of some things he said. Um, I, so go, going, this goes back a month ago when I addressed this on the on on the last uh, Q and A podcast, where I was critical of I think the, the one hour I had listened to Mike on up to that point, um, where I, I thought he was somewhat uh, sloppy in how he addressed the question of Phoebe being a letter carrier, and I think some other things that I, I felt like. Um, he wasn't very thorough or well versed in. Um, since then, I've actually listened to a few more hours of his podcast. Um, I found it really interesting and informative. And in fact, Mike has a, uh, he released a, okay, you ready for this? A six hour long episode on First Corinthians 11. Six, a six hour podcast. Some of you are thinking my podcast is getting a little long here. I'm up to about an hour and a half. He did six and a half hours, over six hours on 1 Corinthians 11. It is incredibly thorough, you guys. Um, I So hats off to Mike for being incredibly thorough with the scholarly questions that arise from 1 Corinthians 11. So um, I repent to dust and ashes if my previous comment about Mike made it sound like he's simply doing sloppy, shoddy scholarly work. Um, I still, I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with his conclusion on first Corinthians 11. I don't know because I don't know what my conclusion is. And I will say some of the stuff on gender stereotypes at the end of that podcast were a little cringy in my opinion. Um, and I, I would want him to revisit some of that. Um, but, um, but in terms of like getting his arms around a whole host of scholarly questions that, um, that arise from the text in first Corinthians 11 from, from, from the little, I, I know I'm like, man, he really seemed to exhaust a, a lot of, if not all of the issues that, that come from this passage. So all that to say uh, toward the end of that six hour long podcast, Mike, he, he wrestled with this question of, of head coverings for today. And I thought he did a, I thought he did a good job on, on that. <laughs> um, and I liked that He didn't just immediately just dismiss like head coverings. Like, ah, it's cultural people shouldn't be doing that. Like he's like, wait, let's just, let's think through this. Why do we say it's cultural? It's rooted in creation. Like and I, I love, I really appreciate the fact that he kind of really wrestled with the question rather than just dismissing it. Um, there is a question in first Corinthians 11, whether Paul's even talking about head coverings, veils, or just 
women having long hair in that passage. So there's a question about whether head coverings is even a thing uh, in that passage. I, I do think from the little I know already um, that he is talking about head coverings or veils. I don't think that distinction matters a whole lot. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, the head coverings it d- does seem to be tied up with certain cultural practices of that day. So if, as I understand it now, again, fact check me on this. I'm going off of books I've read that are, that I don't have in front of me. But, um, as far as I know, in the, in the Greco Roman world, married women of especially higher status, married women would wear a veil, would cover their head as a symbol that they're married. Um, while women who were single or, or, or even just sexually available, including prostitutes, uh, slave women, I think, I think would be included in this again. Fact, check me on that. Uh, they wouldn't veil. So the veil or head covering um, said a lot about your sexual availability and or your status. And to throw a wrench into the whole that whole thing, you you had in that era, um, and this is drawing on the work of Bruce Winter, whose chapter on First Corinthians eleven is really provocative. Really provocative. Bruce Winter's. Um, Roman wives, Roman widows, the appearance of the new women and the Pauline communities. His chapter on First Corinthians 11, I thought was excellent, really good. Um, uh, but you have, so, oh, so, so you have in that era, the, the so-called new Roman women who are married wealthy women who didn't veil, who are bucking up against this kind of patriarchal system and were, some of them were even engaging in adultery and were kind of being sexually promiscuous and so on and so forth. Um, and so he had a lot of cultural symbolism invested in veils slash head coverings. And so Paul, rather than playing that game, who's married, who's sexually available, who's being promiscuous, who's poor, who's rich, just said, look, look, which is everyone veil. Let's all, I want all the women in the communities to, to wear a head covering. So we don't have this kind of class slash sexual available distinction in the churches. Again, that that's at least uh, Bruce Winters reading the passage and, and other people. Um, I think that so far that's the most compelling to me, but um, all that to say, it does seem that Paul is saying what he's saying because this is a first century cult that veils slash head coverings have a meaning, a cultural meaning in the first century that they don't have in every culture today. So in summary, if Christians are in a culture <laughs> that have similar meanings of head coverings and veils and so on and so forth, then yeah, I think that there could be some uh, rich uh, applicability of this passage to Christians living in that kind of culture. Um, but if a culture doesn't, like if the Western American culture, North American culture doesn't have doesn't view head coverings and veils the same way, then I don't think Paul's words would carry the same applicability for today. That's my running thoughts on that. I could shift on that. And again, there's a lot more reading I need to do on this passage. Thank y'all for your amazing questions. Um, And again, if you want to join the Patreon community, patreon.com forward slash theology and raw. And I look forward to addressing your questions on next month's Patreon only podcast. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.